Welcome everybody to our short course on modeling approaches for analyzing healthcare problems. This is an introductory course that gives you an overview and a comparison later on and a lot of discussions as we, as we hope. I teach this uh, course together with Mark Roberts, James Dahl and Uwe Siebert. I'm Beate Jan, I'm an assistant professor at UMIT University for Health Science in Austria. I'm the vice president elect of the Society of Medical Decision Making and my field of expertise is in decision analysis and decision analytic modeling where I apply different modeling approaches starting from uh, Markov models, discrete event simulation models. Currently we have a, a project also with the Asian based model, modeling approach. And the field of research, main field of research is in cancer uh, in the recent years and some work in cardiovascular disease. And now we also have projects related to evaluation of COVID interventions and vaccination. So much to my person. Mark, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm Mark Roberts. Um, I'm a, a, a professor and chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at the University of Pittsburgh. I have been doing mathematical modeling since I think before Viaje was born. <laughs> and, um, I do mostly now, uh, we do large scale agent based simulation models for infectious diseases, and, but I've done all kinds of decision sciences and decision models from um, in, in liver transplantation and pneumonia and HIV and hepatitis C. Um, I'm much more interested in the methods than I am with the specific details of the specific disease. Thank you. And later on, uh, later on, James James Dahl will join us. He is uh, section chief and, and general internal medicine associate professor of medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine in Dartmouth, and associate professor at the Dartmouth Institute. And his areas of expertise and focus is on evidence-based medicine mind-body medicine, and also he has been working in decision analysis for many, many years, being once a student of yours, if I remember correctly. Yes, Mark. he was. He was my fellow for two years. <laughs> and also later on uh, with us, Uwe Siebert, he's the chair of the department here at UMIT, the uh, Department of Public Health, Health Services, uh, Research and Health Technology Assessment. He is a professor of public health, medical decision-making and HTA and an adjunct professor of health policy and management at Harvard University. And he will introduce himself then later on when he joins the session. So, and now, we would like to get you, the participants, uh, to know them a little better. So the first question is, which country are you, are you coming from? And now you need to just uh, use Paul everywhere. So please enter the, the code uh, in your mobile, paulapp.com. Slash one five eight and just um, we don't give categories, but uh, let us know. I mean, what check? Oh, okay, first answer is coming in, so that's good. So it seems we have a North American crowd here. Even if in, in Europe, it's not that late. And also maybe people from other worlds could have joined, but uh, oh, Canada, well, very nice. Okay. 
Next question. Are you from academia, industry, consultancy, or other field? And here I think that I need to unlock. Okay. Oh, okay. So all, no, not all from academia. Welcome to others. Okay, good. And now the final question that really helps us a little bit in the course. To see where we start from. So what is your experience? Are you already familiar with decision trees, day transition, Markov models, discrete event simulation, agent-based models, or infectious disease models? And you can, of course, give multiple answers. Okay, so this looks like you are all, most of you are familiar with this model a little bit. Say transition Markov models. And a little bit of experience also in the other modeling approaches, which is, which is nice. And I think this will foster a lot of our uh, discussion, hopefully later on. Thank you. Thank you so much for participating. So just before we start, we, we're going to have this course now online and at, uh, we will have a, a short break at around um, 10, 15, uh, 15 to 20 minutes break. And if you've got questions in between, please raise your hands or use the chat function or if you have the feeling that this is really urgent and you cannot follow otherwise, and uh, we may not have seen uh, your questions in uh, the chat, uh, just speak up. And we, we send you the slides up front because we were wondering that, or we were thinking that maybe you want to make some notes on it. But if there is other material, material that we mentioned now during the course, and um, also some uh, advertising for other courses, please feel free to reach out. And um, we also provide um, an info letter about uh, continuing education. More information you find in your, in your handout. Any questions so far before we start? The session is uh, recorded. And so please, Feel free to let us know if you are not comfortable with this. And uh, also when you are not comfortable to speak up, then uh, just uh, write it in the, in the chat. OK, so then let's start with a short introduction. Definition of model. As we can read it in the publication of the Good Modeling Research, um, publication. Here it is defined that models are essentially communication tools that allow the complexity of a given system to be reduced to its essential elements. As such, models represent simplification of reality and modeling is necessarily a reductionist methodology. And when you run modeling projects in real life, you really see how these projects foster communication among all stakeholders that you would involve in your projects. This means not only people involved in modeling, so the modeler itself, but also physicians, the decision makers, patient representatives, and so on. And, of, and you can imagine, and some of you experience already, you always have to simplify. You have to simplify reality. However, 
With decision analytic models, they are even if you have to simplify, they are extremely helpful. They are applied in order to select optimal strategies after balancing medical benefits and risks and potentially also cost of different alternatives under uncertainty. And this is important that we, with our models, can capture uncertainty and we can evaluate the impact of uncertainty on our model outcomes and also on respective decisions. The process of decision analytic modeling makes the structure elements and interrelations of parameters of the decision problem explicit and transparent and therefore accessible for discussion. And as it once was stated by James in his publication on different modeling approaches, modeling also, you could see it as going, going deep. So D stands for you describe the system with respect to your patient population, the evaluated technology so, and the alternatives that you would like to compare, the relevant outcomes, time horizon and perspective. You evaluate consequences of strategies, other technologies, and you're gonna do, for example, cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis, budget impact analysis, benefit harm, and in order to capture uncertainty, we do sensitivity analysis. We explore new strategies in order to identify also gaps of knowledge and we could do a value of information analysis with our models to identify what would be or what should be the focus for further research. We can predict and forecast and we can be part of a consensus building process, communication, persuade decision makers in order to support decision making. There are different modeling approaches, multiple modeling methods, but what is common to all our modeling exercise is that we compare. And as you can see here, it's policy choice one or policy choice two. And we compare with respect to various outcome measures that you would define up front. With respect to the modeling approaches, here we can make a distinction and on the table that you see, these are the modeling approaches that we will talk about today. Of course, there are others, but these are the most important uh, modeling approaches that are used in our field. You can distinguish them, first of all, in a sense that whether you evaluate a cohort or you do the simulation on an aggregated level or on an individual level, for cohort or aggregated level, we want to look at decision trees, markup models or state transition cohort models, and system dynamics. And for individual level simulation, you will see and get a short introduction into state transition micro simulation models, discrete event simulation, and agent based simulation. You will see how these approaches differ with respect how we model health states and how we include memory about the history of patients, how we include time and whether and how we can incorporate interactions of individuals in the interactions of individuals or interactions of individuals with the healthcare system. There is quite a list of taxonomy paper that help you to select between different modeling approaches that you can go back later on. Important in our field was the activity, the joint activity of the two societies, the SMDM, Society for Medical Decision Making and ESPOR. They came together and built a joint task force for good, good modeling research practice. This task force put together or brought together more than 50 researchers and people doing modeling hands-on experts from various countries 
And the task force was co-chaired by Jaime Caro, Andrew Briggs, Karen Kuhns, and Uwe Siebert. The work that came out of it, these are now seven publications. And these publications have been reviewed in several steps in involving even more experts in the respective society over a course of two years. And now we have very good guideline papers on, first of all, the first paper gives you an overview. The second, very important, and here Mark was uh, chairing the group, is on conceptualizing the model as a problem. Then we have three papers on specific modeling approaches, discrete event simulation, state transition modeling, and dynamic transmission modeling. And then we have another two papers that are relevant, relevant for all modeling exercise. The paper on estimating and uncertainty, where you get a lot of information how to do sensitivity analysis, for example, the group chaired by Andrew Briggs, and the paper on transparency and validation of models. And for the state transition modeling group, this was chaired by Uwe Siebert and Karen Kuhns. And here also I was participating as a co-author. So much to my very short introduction. We're gonna now, we, go, we will now see step-by-step step what are the main concepts of different modeling approaches. And at the very end, in our discussion, we will see that depending on the research question in how you would select different modeling approaches. But before we come to this, be a little patient and we go step by step. Any questions so far, just speak up, if so. If not, then I hand over to Mark and Mark, I just um, do your slides. So let me know when to. Okay, just go ahead and advance the slide. I'll tell you. So <clears throat> the, the idea of basic branch and node decision trees is that they are useful according to the conceptual model working group for simple models or problems with very special characteristics like very short time horizons or very few outcomes. And there aren't very many plain branch and node decision trees in the literature anymore. They you typically see more complex models, but there have been quite a few. And it still is a almost always some version of a branch and node decision tree is the beginning of a more complicated model. Okay, next slide. So decision trees, markup models, and micro simulations are generally methods for estimating the expected value of a series of choices in an uncertain environment. So the idea here is that you're going to be making a choice between um, any one of a number of, of possible options of how to treat a disease, a problem, a public health issue, and you want to try to predict what's going to happen before you actually make the decision. And these all represent different levels of complexity regarding the level of detail incorporated into the model. Next slide. So the purpose of a decision model is, as I said, to estimate the effects of various choices. So I'm sh showing it here as only two choices. There could be a very large number. But the idea is when you make a choice, that produces a set of downstream consequences. Each choice produces a different set of downstream consequences. Next slide. And sometimes it's really easy to understand what the downstream consequences of a, of a decision are. You know, casinos always publish what their um, what their probabilities are for all the various different games. They run by a strict set of rules, and so you can decide pretty easily. Does it make sense to, to make a, a bet in a casino with a with known odds? And is it worth it to you in terms of the enjoyment you get out of playing? Next slide. Sometimes it's really hard to make these predictions. So, for example, in HIV disease, if you're predicting the life expectancy of earlier treatment in HIV disease starting heart therapy at a CD4 count of 300 instead of 200, or starting with 
at the time of diagnosis rather than waiting for a CD4 count level. Those are hard. Next. And so we use models to help us represent what happens under these different choices. Next slide. So there are a couple of basic components of a branch and node decision tree. The first is that you have to have a very specific situation that is specified with choices. What are the things that I'm choosing between? And that has to be reasonably complete of, the, of, of what the actual decision is. The branches off the decision node are the choices that you're going to pick. Here I'm showing it again is choice one and choice two, there could be many. Once you pick the choice, then chance takes over, or probabilistic outcomes occur. And so after choice one, in this particular picture, outcome one can occur or outcome two can occur. Outcome one happens with some probability T1, outcome two happens with another probability T2. On choice two, there are different outcomes, outcome three and outcome four. They actually could be exactly the same as outcome one and outcome two, or they could be different. The, the trees do not have to be the same on both sides of, of, of a decision node because different things might happen. But again, the, each outcome happens with a certain probability. Once the outcome occurs, it has some value either a life expectancy, a cost, a quality of life. It doesn't matter as what, you're, what you use as the value as long as it's the same across all outcomes. There's a, a in, the, in the design of these things, we talk about things closer to the decision node being upstream or proximal and things farther away and closer to the outcomes being downstream or distant. Next slide. So the whole idea of the analytic mechanics of a branch and no decision tree or any decision analytic problem is what you really want to do is you want to calculate the expected value, those values when the outcomes occur, the expected value of making choice one and comparing it to the expected value of making choice two. And the idea is you would choose the outcome which has the highest expected value. Next slide. Decision trees alone, as I said, are becoming rarer as the sole method for the analysis of a particular problem. They are, however, almost always the beginning of many other modeling methods. So you'll have a decision tree that, that describes the choices, and then there might be very complex models that follow that, that, say, that to understand how to predict what happens under the various different consequences of the choices. Next slide. <clears throat> so, the, although branch and node decision trees are often the common beginning, the real, um, uh, almost all models have some more complicated representation of how you understand the values at the end of a particular branch when an outcome occurs. And in a simple branch and node decision tree, that value at the end of the, at the end of the, of the branch might be simply a life expectancy you know, some number of years or some number of quality adjusted life years. Um, but it's a combination of a lot of very complex events that happen in the lives of people who found themselves in that particular outcome. Next slide. So what the um, conceptual modeling working group decided was that if, if you can divide the problem that you're thinking about or the problem that you're trying to answer into a series of health states where different people are in different states of health, then state transition or Markovian models are appropriate. The primary disadvantage of this is that a transition probabilities do not depend on history. They can, you, you have to increase the number of, the number of states you have that can be, and it can get really large, really, really fast. And as Uwe will show later on, a solution to that is what are called um, micro simulation or individual state transition. Next slide. So the whole idea of a state transition model is that there are certain things that you might, that might be ridiculously complicated to, to, to draw or, or represent in a branch and node decision tree. Like for example, here is a simple disease that it's an artificial disease. And then say in that disease, you can be well, sick, or dead. Those are the only things that can happen. And it's a disease that can recur. So if I'm well, I can become sick. If I'm sick, I can become well again. If I'm sick, I can die. 
or if I'm sick, I can become well, and then I can become sick in a future time. And what you see is if you try to draw this as a branch and node decision tree, it gets really complicated really fast because as time period and time period progresses, the tree gets very, very bushy. Next slide. What you notice, however, is that any given time period, you can only be well, sick, or dead. And if that's true, if you can only be well, sick, or dead, you can represent that as a what's called a Markov process or a state transition process. And the idea there is, is that the states that you describe for your environment have to be what is called mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. So mutually exclusive means that you're only in one state at a time. The collectively exhaustive means you have to be somewhere. You either have to be well, sick, or dead. There's no other place you can be in the model. Now, <clears throat> you can have states that are called recurring states, which means you can either stay in that state time period after time period, or you might be able to return to that state. So here, if you were well and became sick, you could become better again and go back to well. Then there are what are called absorbing states, states that you can't get out of. Usually those are things like death, which you normally can't get out of. Or there are certain things in infectious disease, for example, if you're worried about HIV disease, once you become HIV positive, you can no longer be, ever be in the HIV negative side of the tree. Now, the Achilles heel of these standard Markov processes is this thing called the Markovian assumption that says that the transition probabilities for where you are to where you go depend only on where you are and not where you have been. Markov processes in general lose track of the history of what's happened to that individual. And so the only way to make really, really complicated models is to have models that have really a very large number of states. Next slide. So the, the idea is that when you have these complex models, the Markov models are answered and figured out by doing what's called cohort simulation, where you run an arbitrarily sized cohort through the states. People start in one state, they move from one state to another state, they die from each state, and they move through the model as one whole cohort being distributed over time how they, um, uh, how they uh, progress, and then eventually everybody ends up in the absorbing state. The Monte Carlo simulation, which Uwe will talk a lot about later, essentially does the same thing with a cohort, but puts people in one at a time. The advantage of putting people in one at a time is that by putting them in one at a time, sorry, my dog is there. By putting people in one at a time, you can, you can follow that person and keep track of what happened to that person. Next slide. So these branch and node decision trees and we have been used for lots of different kinds of, of problems. The idea, hold on one second. Yeah, this is what we get used to when we have these kind of online um, conferences and meetings that we get to know all the, you know, the, uh, also um, the other. I'm sorry, my dog is going crazy. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> this happens to all of us, either it's kids or dogs. Or <laughs> right, right. So, anyway, um, these have been branch and node decision trees and simple Markov processes have been used for lots of different kinds of problems, evaluating specific patient conditions, individual one time decisions in patients may not fit nicely into the results of publicly randomized control trials. So, for example, Many of you remember the, um, <clears throat> that it's been known for a long time that if you have atrial fibrillation, you should be anticoagulated. You should not, because anti atrial fibrillation produces an increased risk of clots. But what do you do about somebody who maybe has Parkinson's disease and really bad arthritis and all kinds of things so that they fall down? Because what's the likelihood of falling down has to be before maybe uh, anticoagulation doesn't make sense. Carotid endarterectomy is beneficial in patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis, so we know that. And we know that um, the local surgical mortality um, is 
higher than the studies, three to four percent, what do you do? You know, the, the Friday and endarterectomy trial was done in the five best centers in the United States, and the average morbidity and mortality of three to four percent was about a third of the mortality of the average mortality of people with carotid and endarterectomy in the United States by Medicare. Data. So how do you how do you adjust this? And models can be useful for understanding that difference. Patient preferences for outcomes may be different, and those are really easy to include in, um, uh, in uh, decision trees. Next slide. Here's just a list of a whole bunch of decision analyses that have been done. Usually, some are just branch and node, and some are branch and node blended with uh, um, Markov processes. Um, these are just papers from, say, the last 10 or 15 years that have answered questions that some of them you could answer with other um, methodologies, and some uh, would be too complicated to answer with other methodologies. Next slide. So decision trees and Markov models are usually pretty easy to build. There's a relatively rapid turnaround time, and they're easy to start simple and then increase complexity as needed. They're very well accepted. The problem is that they often require a very large number of states to represent a real clinical situation. And Branch and node decision trees and Markov processes have no capability of actually representing what are called emergent properties, the properties that happen when multiple individual components interact together. And that um, uh, James Stahl will talk about the importance of those kinds of properties in agent based and discrete information. Next slide. So decision trees are rapid, simple, and can provide insight. They're easy to describe and understand. They're difficult to engender real clinical decay. Markov processes, on the other hand, are able to model time-varying events, represent longitudinal clinical experience, and become very large and very complicated very quickly. And as you'll see from Uvi later, microsimulation can incorporate substantially more complexity, uh, complexity, but can get actually a lot harder to control. Next slide. It's now you. Yeah. So this was our first part, decision tree and Markov model. Are there any questions so far? And feel free just to speak up, unmute yourself. You are not such a big group. If not, then I will continue with discrete event simulation. So this three event simulation, where does the term come from? First of all, what do we consider to be an event? It's broadly defined anything that can happen during the simulation. It could be an admission to the hospital, changes in health state, or any, the start or the begin and the end of a resource use. And here we think about physical resources. In a discrete event simulation, first of all, it is a form of uh, individual level micro simulation. So you model individual. So the, in this form of simulation, you describe the flow of individuals through the healthcare system, taking into account the health states of these individuals. And significant changes so events occur at discrete points in time and the simulation moves the time forward from one event to the next. And we will see later on when uh, Uwe is also presenting the state transition models that these kind of models, also the, uh, the Markov model that uh, Mark presented, they are evaluated within time cycles. So you would pre-specify uh, a cycle length of let's say a month or a year. And this is different here in a discrete event simulation because the simulation is moved forward from one event to another. Fields of applications. First of all, when patients interact with healthcare delivery system, so this could be the scheduling of elective surgery. Also for resource allocation policies, for example, there have been modeling projects on liver allocation policies. 
where the uh, donated livers, this is a scarce resource. And it is also applied for pharmacoeconomic um, evaluations. So we see evaluation for cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis, for example, for chronic diseases, uh, but also for screening in cancer. And from time to time, we also find application within HTA health technology assist, uh, assessment. On this slide, this is a star slide, so I don't go into details. You can read there after. This is how the modeling approach has been used over years and how more and more it has been applied in four different research questions for screening, healthcare system operation, evaluation, behavior modeling, or disease progressions. Some specific examples where the application of discrete event simulation is very well suited. First of all, if you have a large number of factors, individuals variability of information on patient history is needed. So if there are a lot of characteristics of a patient or its patient history that determines the pathway of the patient or how um, the patient would in the end, uh, what kind of outcomes we would see for different intervention. As we see in the publication of Lille, where they model major depression and for interventions in major depression, it is really important to know how often the uh, individuals experienced episode in the in, in the past and how long was it, and also how uh, how about um, how good they, they 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 take their medication. Another field of application when there are many activities taking part simultaneously. Or, and this is the major point here, when resources needed to be modeled explicitly, and here we talk about physical resources, to account for interactions due to research resource constraints. And a very nice example here of um, Schechter, it's, a, it's an old paper, but still um, it shows how we can use this approach in order to simulate different allocation processes for end stage liver disease, where we have scarce resources, we do have uh, scarce livers. When we have delays in response, so when we have delays due to diagnostics and then um, the treatment would not be um, potentially uh, delivered in time and as a as an effect of these uh, delay, we would see an impact on the health status of the people or also it may cause additional costs. And if this is the case, also you would need to apply or think about the application of a discrete event simulation. If there is additional information that you would like to have as your outcome parameters, such as the variability, in a stage transition cohort model or Markov model, we only get the mean estimates of our outcomes. So this is different in an individual level simulation as it is discrete event simulation. So because it is a individual level simulation, we can also track the history of these individuals. And in addition to health and economic outcomes, we can also evaluate performance measures of the system, such as utilization of resources and waiting times. And due to um, the structure of the um, um, algorithm of the as the time between the events can differ strongly. Since we not have to deal with fixed time cycles, but also we can have them flexible and this may be an improvement in runtime. However, with um, the computer technologies right now, it's uh, less and less an argument. In classroom, usually I show now here a really nice um, animation, but um, now you just get the picture. 
It is an example of a discrete event simulation where we evaluate, where we simulate an emergency room. So people, they enter the emergency room here, coming by, by a car, and the first they see is a, it's a triage nurse. The triage nurse decides what happens. So we describe the flow of the individuals within the emergency room here. What happens to the individual, depending on the severity of the disease, the individual may just see a doctor or it may stay in the hospital. And as time at once, you would see then how people here line up in waiting lines. And if the individuals they need to stay in the hospital, then you would see them here in bed. And for people that are in the hospital, of course, they, um, they need to, to see a doctor and uh, nurses are um, coming to, to see them, to help them and so on. As an outcome out of this uh, simulation, we will see over time the utilization of our resources, such as the triage nurse, um, doctors and so on. And we could evaluate over time depending on the condition of the uh, individuals, how long it takes them to from entering the system until they leave the hospital. And this is a kind of a, a performance measure that we get. Now, let's think about the main concepts of DES. In discrete event simulation, first of all, we have our entities and entities this can be patients, but it could also be other objects that can move or interact with other entities. So what are our entities here in the example? If somebody wants to answer, just speak up. Then I may just quickly continue, but feel free to interrupt if you have uh, further ideas. So the entities here in this example. So, uh, these, you did get it. You, this is Mark. You got a question in the um, in the chat about what software are you using there? And I think I think uh, you're using Arena, aren't you? That's one of the ones. Yes. Here. Yes. So so this is there this are is multiple a, software. Absolutely, Mark, you're you're completely right. So uh, this is this is Arena. However, Arena is not the only software that you can use. There are several softwares, and we I have it on a uh, on a, on a further slide. Um, alternatives. So this could be a Simulate. It could be Simu, or it could be um, any logic. So this really really depends. And there is also um, a software that is uh, really available just for your, for your information. Okay, but thanks for uh, taking care of the check. The main concept, we started with the entities. The next thing that we consider in, the, um, in this kind of simulation is resources. So resources, they provide a service to another entity. And the resources here, it is, the doctors, it's the nurses, but it's also beds. So a resource could be could provide a service also to several entities at the same time, uh, and an entity could require several resources. And you may want to define upfront the availability of your resources for um, the time of simulation. If a resource is not available right now then this could cause queues. Queues where people then have to wait until a resource gets available. And our entities, they have certain characteristics that belong to a specific entity. And these are described by attributes. And these kind of attributes, this could be age, it could be severity of the disease, it could be a medical history. 
these attributes determine the pathway of the individuals and they could change over time during the simulation. So an individual that enters here being in a uh, severe or critical stage later on could um, be good and finally excellent and leave the hospital. And a last thing with respect to the concept it is general information that we would need to define within the system. And here we use variables. A summary of what I just said, you find on the next slide and you have it in your handout. But how do I now start to build such a model? We describe the flow of the patient through the healthcare system. And we need to think about the pot potential events the health states of the individuals and the changes in the health states, taking into account the interaction between the individuals in the healthcare system, so taking into account limited resources. Now think of a very simple example that the, uh, that the individual experiences a stroke. This individual, this is our entity. And now what happens? It may take a while until the people may realize that this is a stroke and that then they would call an ambulance, they would be transferred to the hospital. So already here we have a time delay that we would model, that we would describe. Then in the emergency department, there may be again a little waiting line in order to get certain uh, checkups, for, uh, for all the diagnostics and finally to see the, um, the, the physician in order to discuss the results. And only after we use all these resources and we, we have been maybe in the queue for the checkups, then we have all the information in order to make the decision about potential treatment. And finally, we're gonna look at the outcomes. So this means starting with our entities, we would assign attributes such as characteristics, age, gender, risk factors, severity of the disease. Then there may be a delay. People may wait in order to get the evaluation within the, um, within the hospital, within the emergency unit. And they do a, a CT scan, further evaluations. Thereafter, I have further information and I can assign and change attributes, such as the health state, or could add new attributes. And then based on these attributes, we could make the decision. In all our models, what we look at are health outcomes. This could be life expectancy, quality of life, or disease specific outcomes. And we look often at economic outcomes, costs. Something that we can evaluate in discrete event simulation, because we model our resources explicitly, this is pro so called process measures. So it's a throughput, it's flow time, waiting time, or utilization. So throughput, how long it would take for the evaluation or to get cured. And here now you see how and when we would choose discrete event simulation as it is described in the best practice paper. Discrete event simulation models should be used when the problem under study involves constrained or limited resources. DES is also an attractive option in non-constrained models. So where I not so I not necessarily have to model my resources, where there are interactions between the individuals, populations, and or their environment. When time to event is best described stochastically rather than with fixed time intervals. And time dependencies are important when individual pathways through the model are influenced by multiple characteristics of the entities. And when recording individual 
entity experiences is desirable. And this last point, so that we would like to incorporate multiple characteristics and also we want to record individual entities experiences. This is not only uh, possible with DS, but also with other individual level simulation approaches. So strengths and weaknesses of DES, it is a form of individual level modeling. And therefore, as I said, patient history can be tracked, interactions between the individual and the healthcare system could be incorporated. Resources can be modeled explicitly. We have no predefined time cycles. And representing and reporting for DS software, often they provide animation tools. So the picture that I that I saw that I that I showed to you, um, it it could be animated so that you can see the little um, entities, the little uh, patients and doctors moving around, which is nice for face validation, debugging, and also for communication. However, Sometimes it is argued that um, animation, this is a reason why I would use DS. And I think here I would argue against it. It is a nice feature, but in principle, animation could be incorporated or could be used for other modeling um, approaches as well. The model complexity, and here people have to be aware of, they, it may lead to long modeling time and also runtime, especially for a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And um, often you need rather detailed data. And usually we don't incorporate behavior. Behavior of individuals, this is what we will see in agent-based models then. On this slide, just a summary of a specific tools. So software alternatives and also web pages that you could go to and have a look and find out about what you would like to use. Conferences, there is the winter simulation conference uh, in forms and also you see applications at um, the SMDM meeting. And for people who want to look and maybe as an, a little advantage of our uh, situation right now that we don't have um, our meetings in person and that we have these um, online meetings. Maybe this is the time also to check out some of these conferences as virtual conferences because now it's much easier. And I, I highly can recommend the winter simulation conference and also informs um, because they, they provide really also technical details. And here you find a lot of freaks that are not only interested in healthcare, but in other fields um, of applications as well. So as a conclusion, a discrete event simulation is a powerful approach that some people argue it's a very natural modeling technique. But you have to keep in mind that always try to keep your models simple and think about your problem first. And still for comprehensive user-friendly off the shelf healthcare modeling software, well, the old software that you, um, that we see right now, it is, you can apply it and it's not really well, some of the software uh, is very intuitive also to learn and you can program fast. However, things like um, automatic calculations of an ISO or a SIAC probabilistic sensitivity analysis is something you need to program, which is usually not a hurdle, but you have to have this in mind. With this, I'm at the end of my part, the discrete event simulation. Any questions on this part? Just speak up. If not, then Uwe now joined us. Uwe was teaching in another course and therefore he could not attend uh, the meeting from the very beginning. But he will now present to you the micro simulation part. Uwe, would you like me to uh, do the slides or do you- I can do the slides. So if you give me the screen, then I can share my screen. Hi, everybody. 
Uh, nice to see you in this virtual round here. Uh, well, advantages is you can also look at this video later on. Um, but I'm going to share my screen. And I'm saying something about micro simulation. Uh, and I mentioned the rewinding this uh, maybe after the course, uh, because some of the things we, we discuss and I discuss in micro simulation, they could fill an hour but we just quickly touch them in this overview course. <clears throat> so you could uh, take more time and look at them in more detail. So is everybody seeing my um, slide, which is called overview micro simulation? Yes, just not? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So micro simulation, just to give you a definition, Micro simulation models are computer models, and they operate at the level of individual behavioral entities. So this could be viruses, persons, people, families, firms, countries, any units, and we usually call them the smallest unit, the micro unit. <clears throat> uh, what we do then is we simulate large representative populations of these low level entities. So if these are patients, we model countries or populations or subgroups of those. But the aim, although we model and we simulate technically individuals, the aim is always to draw conclusions on an aggregated level. So we're, we're not doing individual prediction for one patient. So we're still trying to get the average effect on a population on a country. It could also be a subgroup, but it's still a group of people, although we model technically the individuals. Keep that in mind. So some, some people mix that up. What are the fields of applications? Well, we have many in healthcare. That's why we're looking here into it in the medical decision making um, meeting, the society's meeting here. When we compare health technologies, when we do benefit risk analysis, cost effectiveness analysis, we use them. Now we still have to explain why do we use those and not the more simple Markov models you have seen or other things that are not micro simulations. We use them when we want to optimize processes in healthcare clinics, healthcare demand, processes, management. And we also use them in healthcare finance when we look at economic impact of health behavior. And currently we also use them to model uh, people that run around in the country and infect others like an in infectious disease. In the social science, they have been used for tax benefit models like who wins and who loses when something is changed in, in the tax system. Uh, migration, what happens, you know, if, if people come in and go out of countries. And in engineering, manufacturing, and very often in traffic flow. So all the air, airports and the traffic lights you run through, they are planned by micro simulations. And that's actually the, 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 the piece when you think about infectious disease modeling. It's like a traffic, you know, things flow and one hands it over to the other. Uh, so this is uh, one of the fields where um, micro simulations come when we model individuals. We want to see whether an individual affects another individual, for example. Now, this slide is, uh, uh, is an important and more dense slide. When and now I'm talking about when do we use them? Why do we use them? In which situations we, we, we need to go to micro simulation? First of all, micro simulation takes much more computer time because we have not just to run a cohort once through the model, but every individual, maybe millions, to make the cohort. So, in the first place, there is a huge disadvantage. So, only use it if you have an advantage. <clears throat> And the first one is if you have the Markov assumption, which has been presented to you, which basically means the states don't remember where the people in that states were before. Uh, and, and we want to get around that. Uh, an example is uh, treatment of osteoporosis. Uh, what happens to people really depends on uh, what fractures they had in the past and how many. And if you just take, I mean, you can build states with that, <coughs> excuse me, but if you just think of maybe there are 10 places in the body or even more where you can have a fracture and you can have two fractures, that already means 10 times 10, so 100 different possibilities to have fractures. That means um, 
that you have already 100 states. And to get around that, you can do a micro simulation and you can just track for each person where they had the fracture, sorry. <clears throat> where they had the fracture and, and how often they had the fracture. So the transition probabilities in that case may actually depend and they may increase with past events. A next reason for doing micro simulation is if, if this whole thing gets even bigger, if you have a large number of risk factors, comorbidities, and you have sequential decision problems, so where you can incorporate past outcomes of your decision and can, oh, now we have to change the decision. Um, there is a few models that are very famous. MISCAN is one of them that's coming from the uh, Rotterdam group. Uh, they do breast cancer modeling and other things, and 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 then the decision and and what happens and the model uh, probabilities, transition probabilities depend on the TNM system. So it's already three, you know, things. That's the tumor size, it's the it's the number of lymph nodes, and it's the metastasis status, and many many others. So you would have a lot of different states to do this. And, and we call that state explosion when we have too many states to handle them. In, uh, in, in one of the next slides, I will introduce you to the UK PDS. It's a diabetes model where a lot of patient characteristics are part of and many events can happen. And you will see in an example uh, why they use micro simulation. There is another reason. Sometimes it is, it is important to fully sketch out and model the heterogeneity of everything that can happen. Also the heterogeneity of all patients, the different pieces of patients. So just giving an example, when we have a population between zero and 80 years old, uh, sometimes it's not just as easy to say, well, let's just call them all 40, 40 years old. Um, for example, the mortality of COVID you would not capture because you have to look into these different pockets, the 10 years old, the 20 years old, 30 years old, that you get to the 70 and 80 years old where, where really these mortalities happen. Uh, so if you have nonlinear associations between age and mortality, for example, then that's also a cause to, do, to run the individuals themselves and then find out what's the real average rather than taking an average age of the population and just model that one age group. We call that uh, when linearity matters or when heterogeneity matters. Uh, and if you don't take that into account correctly, then you, you, you may have a bias. Then the next slide, and I keep that a bit shorter, uh, is when we have direct or indirect interactions. There are models like one is the so-called germs model, where uh, it's, a, it's a tool that can model a lot of infections. So infection is a direct interaction. We hand over the virus to another person. Even if that's through droplets through the air, that's called direct. An indirect interaction would be a waiting line. So if I want to get you know, a surgery, but there are other people in front of me, I don't, I don't touch these people. But by knowing they are on the waiting list, uh, it's like if you want to step into an elevator or go to a concert, if there is a waiting line, these people affect each other. The, the one in front of you makes you waiting. Uh, we call that indirect interaction. Both of them are interactions. And if you want to model those, it seems natural that uh, you may have to model the individuals. Otherwise, you don't get the waiting lines and you don't get the randomness of the waiting lines. Sometimes they are there and sometimes they are not there. Um, then if you just for whatever reason would like to report individual histories, you would like to see what happened to all these people uh, and you want to find additional information like, you know, the variability, waiting time for, for the distribution of waiting times, and you want to look into distributional aspects, then uh, these micro simulations are also helpful because they can show you not just the mean, but how that mean, how fair that mean is distributed over the population. One example is, is given in the, in the paper of, of James. Um, and then there are further technical aspects, um, like if you want to do valid subgroup analysis, conditional programming, their micro simulation helps you. 
uh, a problem that you have to keep in mind if if your first order analysis in your modeling the the, the, the base case simulation needs already a million people in the micro simulation then of course any one-way sensitivity any probabilistic sensitivity or even value of information analysis where you have many many loops may lead to the fact that you have to model you know billions uh, millions of even billions of runs and then you can't do that anymore with our current computers so you may be able to do that in the future with a quantum computer but not not now so that's a problem and and we have to really know when to switch to a micro simulation because of that now there are always tricks how you can get around these problems which sometimes are discussed in our society uh, i want to, to, to exemplify uh, one, one run, one micro simulation, how that looks, um, so that you understand that uh, in terms of, um, of the flow. And let's take a hypothetical example. Let's take an example where we say we have a biomarker, a person at risk, like a super bad cholesterol or something, um, which has high mortality, morbidity, and treatment costs. So then the state transition model would look like this. We would have well, we would have deceased and death. Now everybody's in the well state, having that high cholesterol or that super biomarker, uh, and that would lead to disease and disease may lead to death. You may also die from other causes. And now we put in the parameters. So let's put uh, transition probabilities. And what you see here, that the probability of getting the disease may depend on the cholesterol level. It's not like high and low cholesterol. So each cholesterol level has a different risk of disease. So throwing these into high and low risk would not be sufficient. We cannot just have two well states, but we would have to have many well states. And now think about more variables that have such functions uh, than that adds up to a lot of states. So that's how we do this as a micro simulation. Each person has their own individual cholesterol and then we let we let them run, um, and then these people have utilities and they have costs which are associated to the disease or to the transitions. So in a in a in a state transition model, what you would see here, this looks like a Markov trace, right? You go from well to well out to disease in the next state, and you could calculate that with a cohort simulation quite fast, maybe even by hand, uh, quite quickly. In contrast, in a micro simulation, we allow each of these people, you know, jumping each of these micro units individuals jumping into our model have a different here color, a different cholesterol level. And that may influence with some randomness what happens to them. So the first patient comes in, uh, remains well, remains well. That's a person maybe with a low cholesterol, remains well for some time, but then, you know, the cholesterol and maybe still high enough that that person develops disease. The other person may have a different cholesterol level, ends up dead after that simulation after four years. And the third one, you know, goes his or her own path. And what you then get at the end is a distribution. What happened, you know, after the run of the model, after five years, out of 100 people in this case, uh, you see the distribution and you see that the mortality is 53% after four years. Now you would have to repeat that with 1,000 and 10,000 until the numbers get stable, the percentages, because you know there may be still randomness in there. And that's how a micro simulation works. And there are tricks. And in one of the uh, SMDN task force papers, uh, we have also webinars and Beate explains sample size calculation, how you can get uh, a little bit more information, how to know how many people you have to run in the micro simulation. Uh, I'm going to close with one examples uh, with one example, and it's it's really for me was one of the nicest examples to read. It's uh, the UK PDS outcomes model. It's a diabetes model from the United Kingdom. First paper written by Clark, second paper written by Hayes and and co-authors, uh, and this is the model that uh, how it works. The model starts with a lot of patient characteristics. Diabetes is a complex thing with a lot of exposures and characteristics. So already these would make, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of stage because we have different age groups, different sexes, different BMI levels and so on. So that would be 10 times two times two times three categories like thousands of, of states. And therefore they decided 
to do a micro simulation. So they start with individuals drawn from this distribution of the population, and then they start the model cycle. And this cycle, what they did is say, a lot of things can happen to these people. And for each of these risks, morbidity risks, we have an equation, which is sort of a regression equation um, regressing on these characteristics. Now that's for the morbidity. You can get all these things and they do it in a random order so that there is no bias. And then you see then there is mortality. So based on that, you know, gender and, 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 and age and what happened to them, they have uh, mortality and then they, they would die or not die. If they die, you can calculate their life expectancy and quality adjusted life expectancy. If not, now this shows that the, the, the core of micro simulation, they would say, now we go into the next cycle and the next interval. Uh, and, and now they have further equations and basically saying my blood pressure may be a function of the old blood pressure, but maybe also uh, of the myocardial infarction I had in the past. So now these equations update even the risk factors that, that we drew from the population in the beginning. And then this runs again and again. So we have 14 equations here. I've given them uh, on this slide. Some of them are hazard Cox model regressions and some of them are uh, linear regressions and others. And that's how, how such a micro simulation models work. In summary, when do we need it? Well, when we have a manageable number of health states. Uh, then we can use the cohort simulation that has been presented before. But if that number of health state is not manageable, and that's not, there's no number. I mean, some people can manage more or less in their computer code or in their imagination. But when you want to, you know, put a post on your door showing all the states of the model, then there may be a limit. Uh, and that's where you go to individual level state transition modeling. It's a technical reason, right? Because we cannot reflect all these states. That's what we call state explosion. Uh, the next slides are all star slides, which I leave for your reference. Um, so micro simulation is increasingly used, part of it because we got more and faster computers. Uh, currently for the assessment of personalized medicine or also now for COVID-19 public health interventions, you know, if you talk about closing school vaccination and so on, you may, you may to intervene on individuals rather than states. Uh, you need to have a good technical understanding. Um, technical restrictions are still there for uncertain analysis. It's sometimes this method is, makes us slow. Um, we have different approaches. So micro simulation model is not a class by itself. It can be a state transition micro simulation. It can be a discrete event simulation, which is a micro simulation. It can be agent based. Uh, it can be an infectious disease model. Uh, it will increase with faster computers um, and, and what we will still need more research on is the presentation and uncertainty in these models. How are the different parameters correlated to each other and how are the different people uh, sort of, are they, are they really all independent people or how are they connected? If you infect one, you know, does that change the behavior of others? So all that remains to be seen in the future. Thank you and with this I and over to James with agent based modeling. Yeah, do you do it? Thank do, you, do you have questions in the chat or do you discuss all the questions at the end? Uh, we have questions in the chat and I think we have time to, uh, to answer this one. What software do you use when performing micro simulation? That's from Sarah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So, first of all, let me go back to what I said on this slide. Uh, it depends whether I use micro simulation, for example, in a state transition model, uh, where I, you know, basic program my model like a Markov cohort model. Uh, so I can use, I can, if you are asking for, you know, decision analytics of this, I can use uh, 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 triage or, or in the society, we, you know, we started programming our own software. So you find different options there. Um, and and if you have an agent-based uh, model, for example, you, you may use one of these more fancy softwares, um, which is, I think, currently not being uh, able to be done in triage. Uh, for discrete event simulation, for a long time, Arena, like Beate has uh, shown you discrete event simulation, you would use that. And for uh, agent-based model, there are 
new software is coming up um, and and I think it's not not doable in in, in, in triage so uh, help me out I missed the uh, this the, the any logic is one of them that we have used um, but having that said these are softwares and and you know we don't have ties to any of those uh, that are off-the-shelf programmed uh, user-friendly softwares um, what what you always can do is you can program this in you know Python or C++ or any computer language. And you even can try some of them in, uh, you can even do micro simulation in Excel, but then you have to be really careful. And usually we take another uh, you know, user-friendly software to check the results. Uh, but of course, for all the other software, you need licenses and they cost money. Uh, you can do most of it, what we do anyway in R now, but you have to do coding. It's not yet uh, completely user-friendly, but I think that will be one of the futures uh, uh, that, that people you know, use R and, and codes and um, macros basically developed by people like, like uh, in this society in order to uh, have a free non uh, pay for license way to do this modeling. So I, see, that, yeah, I see that there around is that. also uh, Miriam Hooning, uh, one of our also past presidents. Uh, she's also a person you can approach uh, about the DART group, which is a, an initiative at, at the society, which is, is uh, developing their, you know, in a network, their own software. And uh, MUA can be helpful. That's uh, free yeah. open source software developed by um, by Zach in Harvard, yeah, Zach so Amua. And it's yeah. getting better and better. Um, and uh, I find it really very useful. Thank you, Miriam. So what you could do is you could send us that question again in, in this uh, newsletter uh, option that has shown you, or will show you at the end, uh, uh, an email, and then, and then we can send you also a, a list of that, probably non-complete list of that software. Yes. Thank you. And there was another question that, uh, in part, you uh, answered already. Um, is DS considered a subtype of uh, micro simulation model? Well, if you want, yes. Uh, if you want to group uh, model types by micro and non micro simulation, but but I would turn it around and say, you know, if you look at different types of models, and this is how we structured this this uh, course here. Uh, you know, it's decision trees. You see it on the slide. Um, and, and my answer would be decision trees and Markov models, decision trees can be done as cohort simulation and micro simulation. Can even run a decision tree as micro simulation. A Markov model, if you wanna keep the word Markov is a cohort simulation. Uh, so that the, the, the micro simulation version of that would be the individual based state transition modeling, not the Markov state transition modeling. Now to your question, discrete event simulation is Basically, I would say always a micro simulation. Technically, you could be a cohort uh, analysis with a discrete event simulation, but that would be so, so um, um, it wouldn't make much sense. So consider discrete event simulation, a micro simulation by nature uh, and agent based modelings where you have the agents running around is also basically uh, a synonym for micro simulation, uh, but if you have agents that have different roles than the rest of the population, then that's more in a narrow sense what an agent-based model is. Also infectious disease models have both versions. They have cohort models and they have micro simulation. So I, I would always see the micro simulation as a subtype of one of the other classes, but of course you can turn it around. The, the, the only model type that really does only run with micro simulation is discrete event simulation. And agent-based modeling as sort of a synonym. Yeah, so this is James. I'm just going to add a little bit. There are some things you can do in discrete modeling, discrete event modeling and agent-based modeling where it does make sense to have groups where entities come together and, and create an emergent entity. Um, and it's not quite the same as a cohort, but, um, but it's something that uh, you can model. You know, for instance, uh, Let's say you have a political rally and all of a sudden everybody, every individual in the crowd all of a sudden clumps together and becomes, uh, behaves in a, a new and a different way, right? So that's a, 
uh, and maybe in a rational way, which we know that groups of people often often get together and do. So that would be a, something you could achieve in a discrete or agent-based model. That would be not a cohort, but uh, you know, a a a new a, a new sort of uh, group entity that that uh, yeah. has other characteristics than the individual. Yeah. So so you know, sort of a bubble that you could model jointly. Yeah. Thanks, James. Okay, if there are no further questions right now, we do have a lot of time at the end to uh, discuss questions that may come up later while you digest what you have seen and, and hear right now. Until, well, right now, I think it's time uh, to have a little break. Let's say we have the, uh, a 15 minutes break, so we will be back at 10, 1040. And thereafter, James will tell us a little bit more about agent-based models. Okay.
Hello. So, hello, James. Can you see my slides? I can. Yep. You want to you want to just run them, or do you want me to take over? Uh, as you like. I sent you the last oh. version, or I can. Um, I'm happy to to do it. Uh, who's doing uh, si the system dynamic one? I can't remember. Oh, you you are so why don't you, why don't you mm -hmm. hold out the slide? I'll say slide, and for changing. So you, you want to do it? Yeah, wait a bit. I need to stop here. Oh. Yeah, so I'll just say slide and to ask you to move it forward. I had quite the uh, interesting time here to uh, get to get launched. <laughs> yeah, between uh, my internet breaking down at home and uh, and then having access issues from this from my office as well, it was just uh, unforeseen events. How do you manage, so James? Is so. It's so nice to see you. Thanks, you always make it happen. I think it's it's good to start now. Okay. Do we have a quorum? You raise pen. <laughs> see. Mark, you sick of their election yet? Mark, you're on mute. I won't be sick until it's done. I, I just, I, I get so nervous, but it's looking so much, it's just looking pretty good. I, I, I look at 538.com every day. And it's just yeah, we said better. that uh, four years ago too. <laughs> yeah, but, four, but it was very different four years ago. I mean, four years ago by this time, Trump still had a 30% chance of winning. He's only got an 11 to 12% chance of winning now. And last year, you can compare on the 538.com, you can look at the whole four months from last time. And they were going up and down and up and down and up and down like that. And they're now just, they're just consistently. And, and you know, all of the pollsters have, have changed their prediction models and allow for correlated polls now, which they didn't in the past. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I would say, I see that Randall made a point. Yeah, the Economist has a nice Bayesian model for the election. Yep. I've often turned to the Iowa election, uh, Iowa state uh, election election prediction markets. Oh, right. They're, they're, they're very good. 
they are, and, and, and the prediction markets have Trump a little bit stronger than the other ones do. But, right, when people are willing to put their money down, they usually are a little more honest. So we'll see. I don't know. I, I decided that the first thing I'm doing that is truly not, you know, I've been, I, I haven't been into the office since March because we're all virtual and everything, but I'm going to vote in person so that the vote gets counted on November 3rd rather than by absentee. I already voted. Yeah, we, um, so we, don't have early, we don't have early in-person voting in Pennsylvania, but we have early voting by mail. But I decided I want, but they don't start counting the mail ballots until November 3rd. So. Well, you see, you know, Rob, Mark, you probably have it a, a bit harder than I do up in Vermont. Nobody cares what we, we say up here. They already know. <laughs> It doesn't count. You know, you know the big controversy at the, during the primaries was, you know, were you a Hillary fan or a Bernie fan, right? And that got very heated. Um, but that was about the extent of it. Okay, let's continue with our first. <laughs> All right, everybody. So uh, uh, my name is James Stahl. I'm uh, sorry I was a little late earlier. Uh, I had some technical difficulties. It's probably a good model for uh, for either discrete event or agent-based modeling for the, the uh, random events that happened that got me here today, um, from my internet breaking down at home to driving through traffic, whatever you call that up here at the Upper Valley, to getting to the hospital and then having other other information breakdowns that cause stochastic events that make the, my path here sort of random. So anyway, I'm going to talk about agent-based modeling. Um, a lot of the material will be similar to what you've heard before. There, you know, the reason we're doing an overview is because there, there, there are commonalities that are through all of these things and there are some slight differences. So um, thank you, Beata. Uh, so we've seen, I think, this slide before. This is a, a way of thinking about and deciding, you know, really what is the most appropriate model method to use for your problem. And, uh, and that's an important point, I think, if it, ha if it hasn't been made enough, is, um, you know, there is a tendency to, you know, if you have a hammer, you know, think everything's a nail, but, you know, hammer hammers are not always the best thing. And, I mean, just for example, Excel, can do everything, but you know uh, that many of these other software packages can do. But you really need to jump through hoops and and, and have a heavy uh, sort of a, a error check um, uh, burden when doing something Excel, for instance, uh, as opposed to dedicated software. So the main you know the main difference um, to think about when you're talking about agent-based modeling versus let's say micro simulation or discrete event uh, simulation is uh, in essence, the uh, the autonomy of the entities that you're looking at, right? So we've talked about groups of patients, cohorts. We've talked about individuals moving through these things. And when we got to discrete event modeling, we started getting into how do entities interact with um, with their world, as it were. So, and that could be in the case of resources or other patients uh, in discrete event modeling, which uh, is fairly constrained to the question of interaction with a resource or interaction with patients in the form of a queue in accessing that resource. So, um, so that's sort of a beginning point where we're thinking about agent-based modeling. So next slide, please, Beata. Um, so, you know, discrete event modeling can, you know, again, be used to look at interactions between entities. Um, but when you get into, you know, one of the purposes to doing HMA models is, you know, what happens, for instance, if um, people standing in line um, can affect each other while they're standing in line. So they're not just occupying space, preventing access to a resource, but they're actually uh, uh, engendering interactions and behaviors with um, either entities around them or um, uh, in the form of the environment or other entities themselves, which are also interacting. So, for instance, you know, I mean, I mentioned being in a crowd, which is like a queue. You know, it's not just waiting to get 
access to something, but you know, you may be, for instance, if you're not wearing a mask, infecting people around you, right? So that would be a form of interaction that would be occurring um, independent of, in addition to rather than just the competition for resources. So moving on to the next slide. So what's an agent-based model? So um, in a single sentence, agent-based models may be considered uh, independent, multi-agent, spatially unrestricted, discrete event models. Okay, and so what that means is um, there, there, you can think of them a lot like discrete event models, but but the but you're no longer constrained to let's say the predetermined pathways that you often have to uh, engender in a discrete event model, um, and each of these entities. Um, uh, contain uh, not only just information about their state, but can also contain decision rules on how do they behave and communicate or interact with each other, uh, which is a little bit different from your standard discrete event model. And I know everybody on the on the group teaching, you know, recognizes that you know the, the difference between a discrete event model and an agent-based model is a somewhat blurry line. Uh, you can think of discrete event models as sort of a constrained version of agent-based models. Now, the other thing is, uh, once you get into the agent world, um, agents don't have to be just patients or uh, machines. They can be part of your environment. They can be um, um, the weather. They can be in the geography. They can be the landscape. So there can be entities that exist that are sort of non-anthropologic. Uh, non um, and this has to do with sort of the foundation of a lot of agent-based modeling, which is an object-oriented language. That, and object-oriented languages tend to tend to build upon, objects tend to build upon other objects to become more and more complex objects with many, many different traits and attributes. And so the other thing about agent-based models, uh, they act on each other and the environment itself, which we already talked about. Um, so in the upper, upper right-hand corner, we have Agent Smith. Um, for those of you who have not seen The Matrix, which is probably about three people in the world, um, this is a, a computer entity that is completely autonomous um, and, uh, and interacts with, with the rest of the world. So one of the things that happens and one of the reasons that people get interested and excited by agent-based modeling is that when you have all these interactions and rules, um, that are influencing each other, uh, you get this thing that uh, we call emergent behavior, right? So the different components actually become greater than the, uh, than some of their parts, right? So, you know, uh, looking at the pictures on the bottom are sort of illustrations of that. You know, here's a flock of birds or a school of fish. Um, each composed of many individual agents, but once together start acting in their own, with their own behaviors that sort of emerge from the, all the interactions between, between the individual agents. So uh, the example I like to give about fish is um, you might, you know, the fish may say, have very simple rules like, you know, swim, you know, five centimeters in front of the fish behind you, five centimeters to the one to the right, and if you see a shark, swim like hell. And by those simple rules actually can create stable behaviors that in and of themselves can start taking on the appearance of, of sort of meta objects, if you want. Um, I think Miriam has a question. Yeah. Um, so would you say that there is a relationship between the agent-based modeling and chaos theory? Yes. Um, right. So one of the things that happens with the emergent behavior is that um, it can, you know, it can be very nonlinear, uh, like chaos theory. Uh, it can be um, uh, uh, very hard to predict ahead of time. Like some aspects of chaos theory there can be sort of semi-stable states that exist um, that uh, from a distance look, you know, stable, but when you get right down to it, have, have lots of individual um, 
unpredictable behaviors. Um, so I, I'm, I'm blocking on the word in chaos theory. I think attractors, right? So chaos theory can have attractors in it, and so can you know, and and you might think about sort of coherent emergent behavior as an attractor, like a school of fish behaving like a blob, a coherent blob, as opposed to a bunch of individuals. So I think that. Um, and how do they relate to uh, complex adaptive systems? Um, well, so uh, getting back to, you know, so the nature of systems is that, um, that they are composed of individual elements um, that have uh, causal relationships with each other, uh, creating uh, feedback loops uh, either in a positive or negative way. And um, and so yes, um, many. Uh, I was actually just giving a talk on on, on system behavior and, and some of the, you know, uh, agent-based models are are a way of uh, not the only way, but a way of uh, looking at uh, how systems may adapt to um, or be complex, complex adaptive systems. So yes, yeah, so that, that is a way to model them. Though. Um, as we'll get into it a little bit, you know, as and I think it was alluded to in some of the by some of the earlier speakers, is that you know as you get more into this sort of uh, com uh, complex realm, um, it gets harder and harder to check and validate things. So there is a tr there are trade-offs in terms of which tool to use for which kind of uh, behavior. I think in the next talk we'll be talking about systems dynamics, which um, is another way to actually um, play around and model uh, um, complex interactions and and what may be stable and what may not. Um, just moving on, uh, Beata, next slide. So the general modeling approach to agent-based modeling is very similar to object-oriented programming. Um, it's basically a bottom-up approach. You have in here you have individuals that have individual properties um, like gender, blood type, age, um, so on and so forth, um, and they uh, and these properties or attributes can be combined into an entity, um, and then the entities are essentially let loose to interact with each other, um, and that's what creates these complex systems, which in, then in turn um, can inform you of some of um, some of the more complex emergent behaviors that may occur in the system that you're looking at. So that's, you know, we talked about traffic, for instance. That's, um, you know, a common use for agent-based um, modeling. Um, you know, there are some disease, you know, disease transition mo tra transmission models based on agent-based modeling, and again. That all depends on that what level of detail you're interested in looking at, and, and sort of the nature of the question that you're that you're trying to ask. Um, so next slide. So here's a uh, project. Um, oops, sorry, I forgot to turn my phone off because I, because for those of you not in the United States, we still get these spam calls from political political parties trying to you know tell us to do different things. Um, that could probably be deleted from the recording. <laughs> um, so here's an example of where you have an agent-based model where they're using sort of clinic taxonomy to let model a healthcare system. Um, you might have an en environmental entities like the organizations that people belong to. There may be a social cultural de demographic environment. And then once you get to actual delivery of care, you could have individual agents which have characteristics such as being patients, clinicians, or others. Um, you could model the physical infrastructure and have different room types like ORs, emergency rooms, clinic rooms, beds, and so on and so forth that can be put together in many different forms. And you can even have agents that are um, determine the flow of time, like scheduling types. Um, so these are all things that can be put together in, a, um, uh, in an agent-based model. Uh, next slide, please. So I think AnyLogic was mentioned earlier as one of the platforms that are used. These are slides from AnyLogic uh, using agent-based modeling. Uh, they're static slides, and I apologize that uh, 
we don't have the animation right now, but um, so the top left slide is sort of a cellular network and seeing how somebody might migrate through that network and how they uh, glom on to one tower versus the next. The middle slide was a, when you, if you look at this on any logic website, is basically people getting on and off an airplane, which you can see the mass of people moving on and off. And um, interestingly enough, um, uh, that follows a FIFO queue in the planes, your first in, first out, as opposed to, uh, oh, actually, LIFO, last in, first out um, um, queuing model. Uh, and the one on the right, lower right, is sort of one of the classic m computer models or system models is the predator-prey model, right? So whether or not it's sheep and wolves or, um, you know, uh, or other creatures that you know, that their um, their population depends on the availability of you know so of supply and demand. That's another way you can actually look at or use these sort of entities. In this case, a roaming around a physical space, um, wolves eating rabbits, and then wolves running out of rabbits and then dying off, and then rabbits repopulating and so on, and back and up and down, oscillating in a sort of a semi in a, a semi stable uh, population. So moving on next. So a lot of the applications we've we've talked about, and um, so we've talked about uh, the social, political, and economic um, and health sciences ones that um, I think we've all mentioned throughout this talk. Um, flows very important um, for this kind of modeling. Markets are good way, are, are good use. You know, examining markets is a good way to to uh, use these kind of modeling tools. Um, organizational design, you know, looking at diffusion of technology and other, other um, let's say, adoption dynamics are, are sort of uh, areas in which these systems have been used in the past and make sense to use. Um, and just moving on, I, I guess. Some modeling packages that exist. So any logic we mentioned I think is probably the most accessible to most people. You do have to have a, a, some background in Java programming if you're going to use any logic. Um, you know, Swarm is still out there, Repass is still out there. Um, I think uh, what's not included on this Python is now in in the mix as well, as it is with every <laughs> every type of modeling at this point. Um, I'm not. I'll defer to Miriam or some others on the Darth group whether whether or not they've got any any log, any um, uh, agent based uh, programming coming down the pipeline for R. But I would not be surprised if that's going to be available soon, too. Uh, next slide, please. So strengths and weaknesses. Um, the strengths are, you know, it captures emergent phenomena. So you can actually see, you know, how these complex systems may behave and get, and, and get some insights into the high-level behavior of, of, of systems interacting with each other, which is important. Um, it's useful in that, um, like discrete event modeling, um, you can often directly import uh, raw data from what you've learned, as opposed to trying to simplify it, let's you know, or convert it into a formula, formulaic form, like you might do for a simple tree. Um, it's pretty flexible in terms of the problems that you can ask. Um, model weaknesses: these platforms are not for the non-expert, typically, um, though. Uh, you know they are always getting a bit easier. So um, when we're when we get to that point, um, you know it'll be great. But right now, um, you know I, I wouldn't attempt this on your own unless you're an accomplished programmer to start with. Um, and again, as you get more complex in these models and have more degrees of freedom, uh, the more complex or difficult it gets to validate and to interpret. Um, but not impossible. You just have to be like discrete event modeling. You have to be cautious about how you how you uh, do these things. And I think the next slide. Um, you know, just to reiterate, you know, why you would use this. You know, for programmatic use, right? So this is your research, you know, project. Your your R01. Your you know your you know a big group thing that you're trying to do. It's not it's not typically done for a one-off decision. 
Uh, you want to use it when individual lab level behavior is something that's relevant to your problem. You want to use it when there's interactivity, interactivity is relevant to your problem. Um, and not only that, when interactivity, not just um, with resources, but with other entities and other environmental factors are important. Um, that's when agent-based modeling becomes um, sort of a little more necessary than, than discrete event modeling. Um, when you want to embed, you know, decision, you know, decision making at the individual level, right, to see how that um, influences things, um, and you know, and when you're looking for, you know, sort of potential, you know, when there's a potential for emergent phenomena that you that you think are interesting, you know, when individual labor, individual behavior is nonlinear, that's sort of a marker that will have some emergent phenomena. Um, and when people's history influences their behavior, that's another likely case for emergent phenomenon. Um, and when interactions can be variable, um, again, another you know flag that you know agent-based modeling may be useful. Um, and you know when you know when smoothing things out with you know in formulaic you know uh, uh, models is just too simple to capture what you're trying to ask um, uh, is also useful. I mean, that's another indication that emergent behavior may be important to your question. And I know that's fairly short and to the point. Um, I think, do we have one more slide or is that it? Let's take a look here. That's it, but we've got one more question here in the chat. So Randall asks, how do these models relate to complex adaptive systems? Right. I, I, I think I think I answered that a little bit earlier. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, a, a system, you know, a system is basically a group of of entities, for one uh, for one of a better noun, um, or objects that uh, have relationships with each other, and those relationships are dynamic. Um, and once that exists, you have a system that that demonstrates behavior. Um, and uh, systems that you know, um, and the more elements in the system, the more complex it is. And um, a system will be, you know, you can identify a system may, that may be uh, adaptive if it's stable, right? Or it's not easily perturbed by other external stimuli. So that would be one way to model a complex and adaptive system. And you can do that uh, sort of explicitly with agent-based modeling. Um, and so that's, again, one advantage in that you can sort of directly map your question, your net, your, so your complex system network to a modeling framework. On the other hand, you know, a, a translating things into so, sort of um, more simplified form uh, is, um, is also useful. I, I, I'm trying to think. I think it was. Um, well, I can't remember which mathematician it was, but he, who said that if you create a model that models reality to its very last detail, you've learned nothing. Right. So, replicating reality um, is uh, can be useful from a validation perspective, but um, but not from uh, you know, but but in terms of learning principles, you often want to do some form of simplification um, to because that when you simplify your relationships, you're you're making a theory, right? You're trying to understand what the relationships are. Um, can you give an example of a non of nonlinear behavior? Um, sure. I mean, let's say let's say smoking cessation, right? Um, smoking cessation. Uh, let's say for those of you who are clinicians or for those of you who are, have been smokers and have tried to stop, um, you know, we have this model called the trans-theoretic model that models changes in mental state or conditionality in terms of being prepared for, for, uh, for stopping or changing a clinical behavior. But we know that um, when that happens and when, when those changes occur, um, is not isotonic. It doesn't occur at some sort of steady rate or some sort of steady exposure to stimuli. Um, and that it can relapse 
and recur. So these, that's a that's a form of a behavior that'd be nonlinear. Um, and what will be a nonlinear emergent behavior? Um, you know, I think going back to the you know going back to the fish, right? Or, or watching a flock of, flock of birds fly through the sky as a group um, that. Uh, can, you know, moves as a single entity where it, which doesn't um, um, rely on any individual. Or traffic, for instance. Anybody who's ever been stuck in traffic knows that there's these ebbs and flows, and there can be you know congestion about that can that can occur just by little variations in um, people's speed. There's a wonderful traffic. If you're interested in traffic science, I'm trying to. There's a very there's a wonderful um, uh, video of I think one of the Japanese car makers did where they put a bunch of cars on a circular track and then they had them drive in a circle and trying to keep the same distance between each other and the little variations um, in that in the driving between the people even though they were instructed to keep in, in, closely apart uh, a fixed distance apart ended up creating you know, compressions and extensions of the t of the of the of the uh, density of the cars, you know, before and after. So just by little changes, you can have a uh, behavior emerge from just simple rules. Um, there's really, <clears throat> James. There's really simple examples in things like cues for bank tellers and elevators and things like that. You can you can find out that like waiting time will be a reasonably constant increase in the number of people who are waiting. And then all of a sudden, after a certain number of people start waiting, the waiting times go through the field. And right. so there, there are all kinds of things like that that happen in real systems that, that discrete event simulation can, can uncover. Right. So it's a good question. I mean, that, and you know, and so discrete event simulation, agent-based modeling, these are, these are the tools you wanna sort of go to or to get a feel for these kind of behaviors, um, and I kind of, you know, I kind of use that word on a, uh, for, for purpose. On purpose, you know, f you know, part of this is mathematics, and part of it is, you know, uh, engineering, but also part of it's art in terms of uh, getting a feel for how things behave, right? So, you know, one of the best ways to rapidly learn about system dynamic behavior is to play around with models like this. Right, so um, you can gain a lot of sort of pseudo experience quickly um, for, uh, by by using these kind of models to to explore different states of the system and you know get a sense of how things are, how things will likely behave. Um, it's a little bit like I don't know how many people in the room actually have ever taken an analog and electronics class in undergrad. Um, but that becomes a way of learning about emergent behaviors too. Once you've shocked yourself <laughs> any number of times, um, so uh, that's all the slides I have. I mean, I think they're just you know adding to just the overview. And I think we swing back to Beata unless somebody has another question. If there are no further questions. Right now, so as I said, there's also time at the end. Any questions? One, two, three, no? Then we continue. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jane. System dynamics. System dynamics has been introduced in 1950s at the MIT by Jay Foresters. So in the field of industrial dynamics. This kind of simulation approach has two components. So it's a qualitative and a quantitative approach to analyze social, economic, physical, or biological system. And let's start with an illustration of the qualitative approach that you see here in figure one, where Brainsford and uh, colleagues were evaluating hospital admission and uh, capacities in uh, hospital beds in the UK. 
how would you start with building up such a model? First, you need to evaluate, you find out about the elements that are important within your system. And the elements for their research question, and as I said, I wanted to uh, find out about waiting times and uh, um, occupancy of hospital beds. It is the waiting lists, referral rate, and occupancy of hospital beds at the very first beginning when you uh, try to um, think about the problem. And then based on these elements, you think about how are these elements related to each other. So here in this example, well, we have waiting lines. And if uh, waiting lines, waiting lists, if they increase, then this has an impact on referral rates. What I figured out in um, looking at the general practitioners is that if general practitioners uh, realize that there are long waiting lines, they would actually uh, not necessarily send their um, patients to the hospitals, rather find a, a different solution. So uh, refer if uh, waiting lists go up, then referral rates go down. We put the minus signs over here. High referral rates or, uh, lead, however, to uh, an increase in occupancy of hospital beds. Occupancy of hospital beds, if this increases well, we do see an increase in the waiting lines. So we would put a plus over here. However, they, of course, went a little step further and wanted to find out what happens if in the system I would include other components. So if there is political pressure. So waiting lines, or oh, let's start here. Let's say there is political pressure that leads to more money for extra beds. More money for extra beds has a positive effect on referral rates because now the general practitioners, they are aware of this fact. So they would send uh, more people to the, uh, to the hospital. This would then lead again to, so the increase in referral rate would lead to an increase in occupancy of hospital beds, which leads to an increase in waiting lists. This leads to an increase in political pressure. And finally, this also again leads to an increase in, in the money for extra beds. And what you see here, and this is just one loop that I show, this is an unintended consequence. So we would call this a so-called vicious loop. So if we would only have this loop, the system would spiral under, uh, out of control. However, we have other loops within the system that leads to kind of a balancing. But in total, you see how you could approach your, your research question. So you would really describe your, the, the structure of the system using the elements and how are these elements are connected with each other. And in the quantitative approach, here we use so-called stock flow diagram in order to really calculate the outcome. And I will come back to this in a minute. Here, this is the stock flow diagram for our example of the uh, hospital bed and um, where we have the occupied beds as a, as a stock. We have the inflow of the individuals. The inflow is controlled by, uh, by the referral rates and also the flow out of the um, out of the hospital out of the system in general we can say that the these kind of modeling approach is a form of a cohort simulation it is open since we can have a continuous inflow 
and we consider our patients in a way as it would be water that flows through the system. It is deterministic and it is continuous in time. Fields of applications. We see applications for evaluation of disease epidemiology, for heart disease, diabetes, HIV, and so on, substance abuse epidemiology, to model patient flows in emergency and extended care, and also if there is interaction between the healthcare or public health capacities and disease epidemiology. One example that it is used for is to model dynamic transmission model, where we describe the spread of a disease over time. The simplest model that we have is the SIR model. So people would start off being susceptible, then they could be uh, infected and finally recovered. And how would we build such a model using a system dynamics approach? First, we start with defining the stocks. The stock, this is anything that can accumulate or drain. And the stocks in our model here, in our example, these are the susceptible, the infected, and the recovered. Next, I need to define, describe the flow from the stocks or between the stocks. And the flow is so defined by the rate of change of a stock. And here, the how you could control it. And you could, when you look at this picture, you could even think of like a, like a tap that you would draw that in the end controls how much flows from the susceptible to the infected. Defined by J1 and J1, this is um, the formula given here in the infected times the susceptible co times contact rate times transmission probability. And then the flow from infected to recovered, this is then defined by J1, it's the infected times the recovery rate. So we have stock, we have flow, and then you have these kind of uh, converters. Um, this is sometimes called a little different depending on which software you use, but in principle, it means that uh, the converters use um, input parameters, so data, that in the end will um, be used within the respective um, formulas. And you've got uh, the connectors that describe or connect the path of the, of the information from the converter to the um, place where it needs to be, where, where, where we need it for our calculations. Very to, to set up our formulas. And building up your model, so, and this is using Berkeley Madonna as an example. You would really, in Berkeley Madonna, Donna, just use these building blocks that I explained to you. And finally, the system would generate the, the set of equations that describes what's going on over time. And you could run the model and see how the um, individuals are distributed among these stocks over time, taking into account the uh, transmission rates and recovery rates. This is one example. And of course, there are other examples where they apply system dynamics and not necessarily in infectious diseases. Here, one of my star slides, it is the evaluation of uh, tobacco policies, a cost effectiveness analysis of raising the legal smoking age in California. I just quickly would like to show you the picture of the model. Here now, the stocks that they defined 
it is the people that were never smoker, current smoker, and former smokers. People are born into the never smokers, and then they could start smoking. And then also they uh, could quit smoking. And raising the, uh, the age for uh, tobacco uh, consumption so that uh, people could actually buy um, these kind of products. What they assumed in the model that then people would start as a, at a later age and also the percentage of people that would start would, um, would decrease over time. So this is an uh, assumption that they uh, implemented in the model so that finally they could run a cost effectiveness analysis in order to find out what, these, what would be the impact on costs and also qualities and life years for different uh, legal uh, smoking rules. So much to the examples, strengths and weaknesses. Strengths, definitely, it's rather quick to develop and it does not require detailed uh, data. We do have these two kinds of, of approaches, qualitative and quantitative, and it captures complex and non-linear linear relationships. And what we can see and find out is feedback loops. And that we also uh, implement as you as you have seen in the uh, first description. And these kind of models are good for top level strategic insights. A weakness it is deterministic. And in comparison to this, um, you would use in, a, in an agent based model where you don't have this uh, limitation. And it does not account for individual variability only to a certain extent because you, of course you could incorporate um, uh, characteristics of your individuals in these stocks, but then you would need to have really uh, um, a high number of these stocks in order to account for characteristics. Mm -hmm. It assumes a homogeneous population or very small number of discrete groups, as I explained. And, um, the modeling of resources, this is or resource utilization, it's um, rather complicating using this approach. So further readings, some home pages, uh, books, and with respect to software, again, now you see any logic on the slide because any logic is the software that allows you to build models using um, discrete event simulation, agent based and also system dynamics approach. But there is also other alternatives like WenSim, um, PowerSim and so on. In the good practice modeling papers, here we can read from the dynamic transmission modeling group that most dynamic transmission modeling has been performed by using system dynamics in which transitions between compartments is represented by different differential equations. With increases in computer power, it has become, however, possible to realize dynamic transmission models by using agent-based approaches in which each member of the population is represented individually. Deterministic compartment models are useful for modeling the average behavior of disease epidemics in large populations. When stochastic effects, for example, the extinction of a disease in small population or complex interactions between behavior and the disease or distinctly non-random mixing patterns are important, stochastic agent-based approaches may be preferred. So this nicely now links also to what we have heard from James already and to set this in a perspective. Any questions so far? 
So what would you suggest when you start uh, or what are you using for your COVID model? Um, for our COVID model that uh, we have here in Austria, where we um, that we are currently applying to evaluate vaccination strategies, and but it is also used for uh, forecasting here in, in Austria, we applied an Asian-based model because we wanted to really implement um, a complex network structure. We also wanted to implement uh, regionality um, and several characteristics of the individuals because in our agent-based model, it is, oh, well, this is actually a model that has been built years before at the uh, um, uh, GPOP model. And now we are applying it in the in the COVID uh, situation, but in order to have really the most flexibility with respect to this networking and also the, um, the regional structures and so on, we decided to have the or to apply an Asian-based model. However, uh, we also face difficulties with this approach um, because. For example, when we want to optimize uh, some strategies, we have to define specific scenarios and we cannot just run an optimization algorithm with our uh, model, what you could do if you would have a simple model built on uh, differential equations. Further questions? Yeah, let, not, let, let, let me just expand on that because I think that's a fantastic yeah. and important question about some of these different methods that, <clears throat> that if you look at, for example, most of the models that are running at, in a bunch of places on COVID and you look at the ones at Washington and the ones at, in London and the ones in Germany and the ones in, in um, Johns Hopkins, they almost all use variations of equation-based models so that people can play with them quickly and get changes quickly that are just a simple mathematical calculation from a matrix or something like that. You can't do that with agent-based simulation models or micro simulation models. You can't, it takes too long to do that kind of effort. And so the, those of us who've been using agent-based simulation models in our COVID or influenza or other things, it just takes way too long to have something that is easily interactive. I mean, it can take, I mean, for our agent-based simulation COVID models for the state of Pennsylvania, it takes about an hour to run our, um, on, a, on a really fast computer, it takes an hour to run a scenario. So you can't make that, it's not very easy to make that a interactive thing that you can, that you can work with. Whereas the equation-based models, <clears throat> they have incredible speed, but they're hard to instantiate all the detail that you might want, regional variability and all those kinds of things and the individual variation that occurs. So there's, there really is a sort of a trade-off there. Yeah, I, I'd like to, I, I'll take that up a little bit and say that, you know, one of the things you can do with agent-based models, like Mark, Mark has a very fantastic one at his institution, is you can take the output and um, from a lot of runs and create um, or derive some formulaic um, relationships. Um, that you can then sort of distribute or create a hybrid model. Um, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's a trade-off, right? You're, you're, you're taking what you've learned from a, for, for a probabilistic modeling exercise and simplifying it, you know, the, you know, and essentially applying statistical tools to the outcome to, to generate, you know, regression equations or, um, or partial differential equations of the relationships, which then makes it easier to manipulate for somebody else. Um, so, uh, so they have different purposes, but but you can derive some easy to use stuff after you've built the, that's the right. part. In fact, I think those, that that's typically called meta model, where you have the output of your simulation model. We've we've done that a lot. We've run <clears throat> hundred thousand runs of the <clears throat> of the simulation, and then done data mining techniques to, un to uncover what other relationships it is found. You're absolutely right. 
Yeah, this is this is also what 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 we face uh, in in our project because we were thinking of how to evaluate then also long term impact of uh, the different vaccination strategies, and and here we were also we are currently developing we are in the process of uh, scratching it out like a a, a meta model that. Uh, in the end then describes the, the time, uh, the, the long-term perspective, but not taking into account all uh, the details that you would need in the beginning when you when you vaccinate people and uh, looking at the first um, uh, two to three years. Okay, good question. Yeah? No. I, I, I wanted to, uh, I would just uh, go through the rest of the slides, but if you have something to add, James, be free. So now it's the time to, to, to ask questions and good. I, I just see a question from Randall saying, you know, what are good resources for beginners? Um, I mean, I say, number one, take the SMDM courses on each of these modeling methods. Um, that's a really good way to get started on each of these, uh, each of these methods. I mean, taking, you know, taking a full course on them with knowledgeable teachers is very helpful in terms of getting started. Um, I think your your question about the task force papers I think is appropriate. I think everybody should probably get a copy of all the task force papers because even though they're not necessarily good for tutorial purposes, they are good for sort of understanding, you know, um, the right methods and ways to ver verify and validate and put things together. Um, and so those are my two steps. I mean, you know, I think there's nothing quite like having a teacher who actually knows the software and can, you know, because one of the challenges of learning any of these things is the software platforms all are a little bit different and a little bit, you know, have their own quirks. Um, and you can spend a lot of time looking for a specific button on your on your <laughs> on your interface. Uh, which is not really a learning experience, um, and but going with it, going with a teacher to actually walk you through some of the stuff to get you started, I think is a is a really good fast way to get get launched. Yeah, there is. I mean, I Beate, I don't know whether you want to mention uh, the UMIT course, which has a similar structure as this course, but runs over three days. Yeah, in this in this course, um, you would learn hands on uh, these different uh, modeling approaches that we hear um, ex explain theoretically. But um, in the course that uh, takes place here in UMIT in Austria, and potentially depending on the situation, we have a virtual uh, course. Then you also can try different software. So we we teach like simple decision trees and Markov models using Excel even, and we have uh, triage, uh, arena, Berkeley, Madonna, and so on. And, uh, and the task force papers, uh, we will send you uh, afterwards, so for your, for your reading. Further questions? Otherwise, I just uh, continue in order maybe to foster further uh, discussions because um, often we get the, the question like, oh, how do I now decide on which uh, modeling approach to use? And the, uh, the, the general question, well, it depends on your research question. And um, since we are all living now in this uh, pandemic situation, I thought that uh, we wanted to give you some examples that even in the field of modeling COVID, we see different modeling approaches that are appropriate for certain research questions. And the first project that I found on um, state transition models, so Markov models, is actually uh, uh, supervised by Miriam. So it is on emerging therapies for COVID-19, the value of more clinical trials versus implementation. 
the the work you find uh, still at uh, the the conference, so you can check out the um, the web page. And maybe Mirja wants to explain why she used this kind of modeling approach for her research question. Sure. Uh, yeah. So we've kept it uh, pretty simple in the sense that we have a Markov model because it's uh, recurring events over time, and we wanted to model that. Um, but our, our main focus is the value of information. And we wanted to make sure that the model could run fast. So what was Mark was referring to, as soon as you start doing micro simulation, you run into this issue that it uh, takes forever to model it. Um, so we want to keep away from micro simulation because uh, adding in value of information analysis is going to increase all the, the levels and the calculations that we need to do. Um, and we want to create a our shiny app that can then on the fly give users answers as to you know is it useful to do more trials given a particular status at that point and yet it's, it's a changing landscape over time every time every day you come to your computer and then there's a new trial and there's new results uh, you know, you've got to keep changing these things so that's why we chose for this particular model type. Thank you. And then I continued my search and uh, looking at um, presentations that we have here at the SMDM meeting. And there is one talk that has also been presented at the keynote for the um, COVID panel. Uh, discrete event simulation model, discrete event simulation for COVID-19 testing, identifying bottlenecks and supporting scale up by Erika Grellet and, and colleagues. So the goal was how to, how to overcome bottlenecks in COVID-19 testing to scale it up to needed levels for safe or reopening for society. So she was modeling, or she is modeling uh, the the process where, when you uh, do the testing and how do you do the evaluations then in the labs and all the steps that need to be done. So she was describing the flow, and you can't hardly read from the uh, slide that I'm presenting, but in your handout, and also you can uh, check out the uh, the web page. So since here there is this interactions and you want to find out about the flow, um, availability of resources and maybe scarcity of resources that leads to um, an increase, leads to waiting times and so on. Since this is what she was interested in or is interested in, she applied a discrete event simulation model. And then there are other research questions um, the evaluation of contract tracing policies against the spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2, an application of an agent-based simulation, and this is from our group. So this is from Drahtwarenhandlung and the uh, Technical University of Vienna, and who was also a co-author here. The agent-based model, as I said already in the discussion with Miriam, here we implemented a um, rather comprehensive network networking structure for Austria. So with our um, population model, that is the basis of our model, we describe the entire Austrian population, which is uh, 8 million in inhabitants. And on top of this, we use a modular um, structure. We have a, mod, um, a disease model, module, the contact module, and the policy module. And we continue applying these, uh, uh, this model in the next step or in, uh, in parallel, so to say also, um, to evaluate vaccination strategies, considering limited capacities. And then a um, nice publication that I found in Landsat, the effect of control strategies to reduce social mixing on outcomes of COVID-19 epidemics in Wuhan, China, a modeling study. And here in this example, and also in the uh, previous example with the contract tracing, 
of course, we do care about the interactions between uh, the individuals and the spread of the disease. And this is one reason uh, and an important reason to go for an agent based and also here, this is an, um, a model based on differential equations. And they build an SIER uh, model. So again, you can see these kind of uh, uh, compartments. So the um, susceptible, uh, the E and the infected and the recovered. So exposed, infected and recovered. So it really depends on what are you interested in, how you would frame the question and not always the, the decision, well, not always there is one um, kind of modeling approach that you could use. There are for many questions, there are alternatives that you could apply with its pros and cons. And now the floor is again open for, for further questions and discussions. So, so let, let, let me just say one thing about the, the where to go next if, for somebody who uh, really, really wanted to go next. I think the, <clears throat> there's, there's, there's sort of a split between going and learning about a particular software tool, like an agent-based software modeling tool or a Markov process modeling tool, versus learning about modeling in general. And they're, they're not always the same. And they're sometimes a little different. That, that you can, you, we, you can have your very first modeling course be an agent-based simulation modeling course, or you can have your first modeling course be something else. I think what's important if you're going to be doing this stuff is to, is to have a little bit idea in your head of what is the question you're trying to answer and, and use some discussions with people who've already worked on these problems and things like that to sort of figure out what kind of modeling tool do you need to understand the best way of describing that and then go learn those those particular tools. Also. And then I, I won't I won't say anything about any particular kind of software, but I would say if you really want to learn stuff really well, go to Ubi's course in, in Innsbruck because it's really beautiful and you learn a lot of stuff. Thanks. <laughs> Particularly if you like skiing. Absolutely. You can go skiing, hiking, whatever. So we are in the middle of the mountains. So wait until COVID is gone because otherwise you can't infect it there. Yeah, we already postponed it. So the next course is in May. So fingers crossed. And there well, after you have the stranded hmm? someplace, that's a bad place to get stranded. <laughs> but maybe while we are waiting, I don't know, uh, uh, Mark or James or Miriam, if you want to give maybe a little bit uh, of insight into uh, your modeling experiences, uh, maybe what you have done with COVID or also with um, other topics, other projects you are currently working on. Well, I can tell, say a little bit about my experience. I've really focused on um, micro simulation, cohort state transition and decision trees. Um, and then with probabilistic sensitivity analysis and value of information analysis. Uh, I've dabbled in discrete event simulation. I actually did your course in Norway with uh, the European Society of, uh, of um, well, we the European meeting of SMDM, where you also allowed us to use some of the software and, and led us through that, which was really nice. I really enjoyed that. Um, and uh, 
nice to get this overview. Thanks so much for uh, a good overview. Sort of uh, put some dots on the eyes for me and crossed some T's. How about you, Jane? Um, well, you know, I've spent most of my time doing a lot of screen event modeling work. I mean, it's very, it's highly relevant um, to work that I do in terms of clinical redesign um, in the hospital and the hospital networks. Um, so you know, and I, you know, I haven't, I haven't taught the discrete event course for a while, but maybe it's time to re revise that um, for the, for the, uh, um, for the society. I, I'm, I don't have anything specific to comment on right now. I think. You know, one of the things about modeling all these different ways, and, and one really good reason to at least examine um, all these different modeling methods, is that it they all have a language of their own, and they all have a perspective of their own, and um, and it w will allow you to see the world in different ways. I mean, I think most people, when we teach sort of you know sort of decision trees, right? If they're not if they're new to it, you know. Once they've done a decision tree course, every, everywhere they look, they see decision trees, right? So, um, and after you've done a discrete event course, you can't but help yourself by seeing cues everywhere you look. Um, and so, by you know doing some of these modeling methods, uh, it can inform your view of of a lot of other things around you. So, I think in and of itself, that's a useful practice. Um, to uh, be able to, you know, understand and frame problems in ways that uh, you couldn't before, just because uh, the modern language allows you to see things in different ways. And how do you experience when you uh, do this kind of optimization uh, modeling for the hospitals? How um, how about the communication of these results and the, the model itself to decision makers? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so this is where, um, um, you know, decision makers as a rule um, are not very interested in the mechanics of the information that you give you. Give you. Um, they want to be able to make it, you know, the decision makers tend to be satisficers, right, which is, um, people making the best decision they can with the information they have at the time that they have the information, at the time they're making a decision, as opposed to optimizers or maximizers or minimizers. And um, and what what's really important in terms of your modeling for decision makers is for them to have trust in you and trust in your models. And that... Um, uh, once that's established, then presenting the results is usually really much easier. Um, so it is worth invest. You know, if you're new at this or the institution's new at this, it's worth investing some time. Um, you know, showing the validity and cultivating the trust in the models um, uh, before you go further. Um, that's always going to be a bit of a moving target. Um, and it's very rare that somebody wants to have all the information that you've done and, and you want to present to them. Um, uh, so you have to learn how to sort of dial it back a little bit uh, in terms of, you know, what, what information they really want at this moment. And that's, that's a little more human psychology than model building. But, um, but if, you know, if you do it right, uh, you, can, you can help push policy in a direction that you think is better. Um, and um, yeah, I think that, you know, that's again, part of part of the art of being a modeler is how do you communicate with your, with the people who are not modelers. And this is where, you know, honestly animation in some of these packages can be quite useful is that um, it provides that first step of face validity uh, to folks um, and a sort of a general um, 
common frame for looking at a problem. Um, so that's helpful, but there's no there is no one way. You have to you have to you have to make uh, you have to educate the decision makers and also take them for where they're at. I think James's notion that that making sure that they believe you and trust you is one of the most important things. And I think a, a really good example of this is weather prediction. And where is the hurricane going to go? There's not a single FEMA official who actually understands how those models work. They're incredibly complicated, um, huge data pools of agent-based and all kinds of other physics models that create the where is the hurricane going. And yet they've sort of figured out ways of beginning to present the where it's probably going and where it might go and, and those, those confidence bands and things that, that allow decision makers to look at that and say, gee, we really ought to evacuate these places or we don't need to evacuate these other places. And so I don't think you need to, you, you don't need to convince the decision maker that they really understand every component of your model. But I think James is absolutely right. You, they have to believe that your model is reasonably is valid and is giving them important information. And then I think providing for them graphical descriptions of what the model is saying about their particular decision that they're faced with is, is very useful. Yeah, and try to avoid magic markers, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Sharpies are bad. Don't use Sharpies. It's actually rather surprising, I think, that how well the weather forecast is presented with all their animations and pictures and, and apps and so on, compared to how poorly we are at you know, conveying our results to the general public and to stakeholders uh, in, the, in the medical decision making world. You want to comment yeah, on I that? Think you're, I think you're right, Miriam. That the, the CMU group run by Ronnie Rosenfeld, which has been doing a lot of the influenza and COVID predictions. They've won the CDC's COVID prediction, um, I mean, influenza prediction uh, uh, contest for the last five years in a row. And what Ronnie says is that we need to make, well, he cares about infectious disease prediction modeling as useful as weather prediction. I mean, that, he uses that as the, the whole goal of his, of, his, of his group at CMU is how to make it like weather prediction and as acceptable as weather prediction. So I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I, I would, you know, so I, I think one thing not to forget, however, is that um, weather prediction has two big advantages over us in terms of the medical uh, field. One is they've been doing this for decades, right? Dec you know, so people have been seeing weather predictions for decades and decades, so they're familiar with it. Um, and the second thing is that everybody experiences weather, right? So <laughs> um, there's sort of a shared, there's a shared experience to that, that that makes it more tangible to people who are seeing a model like that. Everybody knows what it's like to get wet in a rainstorm. Not everybody knows what it's like to have a particular disease or or feel that risk of you know a disease and that's I mean it's something we have to work on but I think I mean we always put we put weather prediction and presentation up as sort of a gold standard but you know it, it took a long time to get there you know it, it didn't happen overnight right. I mean that's, people used to make fun of weather weathermen all the time for, for a very long time yeah and I think maybe yeah this is something for us to yeah, to work on. With this, we are at, at the end of our time. So in your in your readings or in your in your handouts, you also have an overview of, of further guidelines that could be helpful. I would like to thank Onco Tyrol for, for providing uh, financial support. You have the contact data of the uh, people that have been presenting here. If you want to learn more or even get involved, please reach out, look at our homepage and send us an email. And we truly hope that we can see you all in person at the next meeting um, in Berlin, the European meeting in uh, May 
uh, in June 2021. And then the next North American meeting is planned in uh, Toronto. And as we said already, and Uwe mentioned this, we have a continuing education program, HTADS, and within this program, you can learn about uh, epidemiology, causal inference, and other things. And in addition, we have the course on different modeling approaches where, where you learn hands-on these modeling approaches that you saw and um, learned a little bit in a nutshell today. And if you want to subscribe to get further information, please feel free to send me an email. And yeah, it would be great to see you all, or some of you, in Austria at one point in time, participating in our modeling course. Thank you all so much for being with us, uh, raising questions, and I hope you Enjoy the rest of the conference. Right, see ya. And thanks to all the presenters, Mark, James, Uwe. Always a pleasure.